Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service this morning. We are glad that we can connect with you in this way. And uh, we're also pleased to uh, be able to announce that for next week we will be resuming our services, albeit with a limited number. And we trust that we'll see many of you in person next week as we do that as per our communique in the week. And uh, so I'm really just praying that uh, this will be the last time that we have to uh, conduct our services in this format. Obviously, our services will still be uh, online. They will be recorded at the first service, and they'll go out on the same day. Uh, but in this form where we have to uh, have no one present, I think it'll be good to get everybody back again even though it is such a small number. So we have been dealing with a series, as you know, on uh, the teaching of Jesus, uh, what Jesus taught about a number of things, and we've been looking at what he taught about love, what he taught about uh, things like uh, pride, what he taught about anger, what he taught about revenge and retaliation, and this morning, uh, as it's fitting, at the end of the month, we normally, of January, beginning of February, we normally would hold a covenant service uh, where everybody would be involved and we would be sharing around stewardship. Uh, I think it's fitting that we speak about the whole teaching of Jesus around greed. Uh, before we look at the passage that we could look at today, uh, perhaps just a little story to, to set us off. Uh, in my first year uh, of university, uh, so that was quite some time ago, there was a movie in which a very young Bird Reynolds plays Sonny in a movie called The End. Uh, and in the movie, he finds himself in a very dark place, apparently because of ill health, and decides he's going to commit suicide by swimming out to sea as far as he can go until he's exhausted, and then he just will allow himself to go under. However, after swimming a few miles from shore, shore he kind of has this change of heart and realizes that this, this is a pretty horrible way to die, and so he decides not to go through with it. But the tide is really strong, and it's carrying him out further and further, and so he starts to kind of bargain with God, uh, promising God that he'll be a better father, uh, a better husband, a better man, if God will only save him. And he cries out, God, please, let me live, let me live. And he tries to swim back to shore, but the tide's too strong, and it takes him even further out. And then he starts to promise God that he's going to obey all of the Ten Commandments, and he starts to kind of recite them, and he only gets to two of them that he knows about, and then he promises God that he's going to learn them all and then obey them if God will just save him. And yet, still, he drifts further and further out. And then, as his kind of last energy is draining out of him in desperation, he says, God, if you save me, I'll give you 50% of all I make. I mean, nobody does that, Lord, but I'll give you, I'll do that, 50% uh, of all that I make. And then still the tide starts to take him out, and then all of a sudden he finds himself starting to drift towards the shore. And um, as he gets closer and closer, and he realizes that he can actually make it to the shore on his own steam, he says, Lord, I, you know, I know I said 50%, but you know, let's just make that 10%. I mean, let's be realistic. Let's start with 10%. I know you saved me, but you're also the one that caused me to get sick. So let's kind of, let's just keep it at 10%. And that's kind of how he finds himself as he comes up onto the, the shoreline. And I often kind of think of that story it's almost, it's humorous in many respects because it, it so vividly reflects the attitude of so many today. Giving to God or living for God are sometimes thought of as kind of paying our dues, fulfilling some kind of obligation. 
And so today we get a look at what Jesus taught about greed. And the passage is one that precedes the passage that we've been looking at over this past week on worry and anxiety. And it comes from Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's just bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? Lord, we just thank you for yet another opportunity of just coming together and listening to your teaching. For Lord, your, your teaching is so different to so much of the teaching that we hear. It comes alive in our heart because your teaching is not just informational, it's transformational. And we pray, Lord God, that we would heed your teaching in such a way that we'd be able to do what you say and that we would derive the benefit and the, the blessing and the joy of being obedient to your word. And so just bless us as we listen, help us to be attentive to what you want to say to us. And Lord, most of all, may we be doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon or money. Jesus, outside of the kingdom of God, had more to say about money than any other topic that he taught about. He told 30-something parables, and 16 of them dealt with money. If you happen to have a concordance, you will find that there are some 272 verses that speak of believing or belief. 371 verses that speak on prayer. 714 on love. And yet on giving, or being a giver, we find 2,162 verses. Three times more than love, seven times more than prayer, eight times more than belief. Clearly God wants us to understand that we must be givers in life, which is why he immediately goes on to talk about not worrying about so many things and speaks of the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. So what should our attitude be towards greed? And of course, the opposite of greed is generosity. Three things that I want to point out today around Jesus' teaching from these verses. Firstly, our giving <clears throat> is an act of worship. So first of all, our giving is an act of worship. It's an expression of gratitude to a faithful God for his goodness to us. Giving is not something the church demands or something that we do because there's some great need. It is a response of gratitude. Worship comes from an old word in the English language for worthy. We give to God because he is worthy 
of our praise. We worship Him with our lips, with our gifts, and with our lives. So how ought we give? Leviticus 27.30 says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And so the Old Testament standard for giving was a tithe. The word literally means a tenth of what they own belonged to God, and therefore it was holy. It was set aside. Holy means to separate, to set aside. It was God who blessed them with crops and herds and the ability to, to work the land. And out of their gratitude for his provision, they were to return a tenth of everything they had to him. God promised to bless their obedience in this area with a wonderful promise in Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. What an incredible promise. You say, well, that was the Old Testament. The word tithe is not even mentioned in the New Testament, so surely we've been released from that kind of standard. Well, you're right. The standard in the New Testament, in fact, is summed up in the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, God loves a cheerful giver. Jesus illustrated the principle of genuine sacrificial giving in his encounter with the rich young ruler. The young man, as we know, came to Jesus in search of heaven and asked Jesus what he had to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus' response was that he should obey the Ten Commandments to which he applied that he had done so since his youth. And then Jesus said, Well then, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Interesting, because here in Matthew 6, we read where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And then he says then you can follow me. The Bible says when the rich and young ruler heard this, he went away very sad. Why? Because he had great wealth. So what Jesus was doing was really sharing the principle of stewardship. You see, in the Old Testament, God said that 10% of everything we own belongs to him. In the New Testament, 100% of everything we own belongs to God. He's the owner. We merely possess what he already owns. This is almost the same as him saying, as we've heard it said, you know, we, we, we've been talking about this over and over again, when he says, you've heard it said, you know, give a tenth of all that you earn to the Lord, but I say to you, in other words, this is what it was like in the Old Testament, but I say to you, I give new meaning to what was written in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was a partial picture of a greater truth. It showed us that God had certain claims on our lives, but the New Testament shows us the full extent of those claims. God does not just own part of me, he in fact owns all of me. To live in a way that acknowledges that everything, not just my 10%, but everything in my life, all of my possessions, all that I have, my family members, everything belongs to God. And that is my act of worship. When I give that 10%, of what he's given to me back to him. Or when I give to him cheerfully what he has first given to me. 10% was the Old Testament standard, but in the New Testament, it's almost like the minimum standard. Of course, the other New Testament example of this principle is the story of the widow's might in Mark 12, 41 to 44. And sometimes we tend to highlight the smallness of her gift. I mean, it was only a might. But Jesus' point was not the smallness of her gift, but rather the extent of it. How so? Because she gave everything she had, Jesus said. Freely you have received, freely give. The point 
is not whether you will literally give away all that you have, but whether or not you recognize God's complete and unconditional ownership of all that you possess and a willingness to, in fact, part with it. And it's that attitude that is a true act of worship. So it's an act of worship. And giving, secondly, is the litmus test of how much I trust God. The Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. We've seen this in our past study and our devotion of the fact that God is aware of all our needs and He'll take care of us. And so if I don't believe that deep down in my heart, that truth deep down in my heart, I'll never be able to give on any meaningful level. The Bible says whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously, in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. We can be generous in our giving, friends, because we have a God who cares for us and who provides for us. The more we seek the things of God, the things of the Spirit, the less material things should mean to us. We still use them, we still enjoy them, there's nothing wrong with them, but we recognize the one who has given them to us. We understand that we ourselves do not actually own them. We are merely stewards of those things. And we need to keep a loose grip on them. Now, we know the instruction that John Wesley gave to the church. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Problem is we tend to say, earn all you can, can all you earn, and sit on the lid. We do not trust God to provide for our needs. Do you remember the people of Israel in the Sinai Desert, they needed food and God gave them manna from heaven. And we read that each day they were to go out and collect as much manna as they needed for that one day, no more and no less. And we read that those who collected little found it to be enough. But there were those who collected more than they needed. And they tried to store it away in jars But when they went to the jars the next day to eat the manna, what did they find? They found that it was rotten and full of maggots. And what was the lesson to those Israelites? And what are we to learn through all of this today? It was that the Lord was their supply. They were to put their trust in God for their provision on a daily basis and not allow their provisions to be their security but rather for God to be their security. And that's why it was full of maggots. God will only give us enough for today. And when we are looking for more and more, and we are trying to satisfy that more culture of our day, that is when it comes very close to greed. They were to look to God for their security, not their stored supplies, And there are many people today who who trust in their bank accounts rather than in God. They've placed their security and their trust in something other than the Lord. And that is idolatry according to the Bible. Then thirdly, my giving tells me where my heart is. Have you ever wondered why So many people in parts of Africa, South America, China, Indonesia, other Eastern nations have such a a hunger and and a genuine passion for the things of God. How is it that they are able to spend so many hours in prayer, in worship? Why do so many of their churches almost grow exponentially? You would think that we 
especially in the West, who have so much, who have been blessed by God in so many abundant ways, would be more full of worship and praise than anyone else. We'd be able to spend more hours in prayer and in worship and, and not lo- look at our watches on a Sunday morning or during a devotion because we are hungering and thirsting after God because He has blessed us so much. So why is that? I think the simple answer is in this verse, friends. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. The sin of Hedonism, materialism has blunted our spiritual passions. Material things are our focus. They preoccupy us. We all believe we can handle the temptations that accompany material wealth. But the truth is for every ten people who handle poverty, only one can really handle prosperity. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or he or she will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The only way to break the tyranny of greed, friends, is through generosity. Let me pose a couple of questions that can kind of be a diagnostic for your heart this morning. Two questions to help you discern where your heart is on treasure, on stuff. First of all, are you giving more this year than you were this time last year? Am I more generous than I was a year ago? Now, I say that cautiously, realizing that Some through COVID have lost jobs. Some have had reduced income and so on. And so one cannot just do a straight comparison. But all things equal, am I giving more? Proportionally, am I giving more? Am I more generous today than I was a year ago? The second question follows on from that. Do I have a bigger heart to give than I had a year ago? Do I have a a bigger heart for the poor, for the needy, for mission, for the broken, for those out there who are in such desperate need? Do I have a bigger heart than this time last year? And as I thought about these questions, I have to be honest, I'm not sure I do. Two great diagnostic questions to to question where your treasure really is. Life in the world apart from God is primarily preoccupied with increasing your standard of living. Life in the kingdom of God is primarily focused and preoccupied with increasing your standard of giving. In the world in which we live, if you allow yourself to be shaped by it, the pressure will be that success will be defined in terms of whether your standard of living is better this year than it was last year. Are you spending more money on yourself this year than you were last year? And that's the way in which you will be tempted to measure your success. That's the way of the world. But it is not the way of the kingdom. And so Jesus introduces a metaphor that's very important as it kind of sheds light on his understanding of human nature. The eye is a lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? The metaphor has to do with perception. Your ability to have clear insight or clear vision basic principle that is involved here is your, your actions flow out of your pre, 
or, or rather your actions flow out of your perceptions. If when you look at the poor or needy, you think about them as Jesus thought about them, and you feel towards them as Jesus felt toward them, then you will find yourself behaving toward them as Jesus behaved toward them. If your eyes are good, then your body will be filled with light, and you will walk in the light, and you will do good and noble things. You will do, in other words, what Jesus did. But if your eyes are bad, if you look through the lenses of greed or cynicism or envy, then Jesus says your whole body will be full of darkness. You will walk in that darkness, and you will find yourself doing greedy or envious things. And then in verse 24, Jesus kind of draws his conclusion. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So how do we conquer this tendency we have towards this this whole scourge of greed? How can we every day find a way to to tell money that you're not my master? To say, sorry money, you are not on the throne. You cannot be the God of my life. Well, as I've indicated already, the primary way of doing that is being generous. I want to give you an example from Richard Foster, who wrote, of course, Celebration of Discipline. And he writes, and I quote, Not long ago we had a swing set. Not one of those store-bought aluminium things, but a real custom-made job, steel pipes and all. But our children would soon be beyond swing sets. So we decided it would be good to sell it at a garage sale. My next decision was what price to put on it. I went out into the backyard and I looked it over. It should bring a good price, I thought to myself. In fact, if I touch up the paint just a bit, I could up the ante. And if I fix the seat on the glider, the seal on the glider, I could charge even more. And as an aside, notice that these were things he didn't do for his kids when they were playing on it, but just when it's time to sell, this is what he starts to think. It could bring in more money. All of a sudden, he says, I began to monitor a spirit of covetousness within me, and I became aware of how really dangerous it was spiritually I went into the house and rather tentatively asked my wife if she would mind if we gave the swing set away to some child in need rather than selling it. Not at all, she responded very quickly. I thought to myself, rats. But before the day was out, we found a couple with young children who could make use of it. We gave it to them and I didn't even have to paint it. The simple act of giving, and this is such a, I think, critical phrase in this testimony. The simple act of giving crucified the greed that had gripped my heart, and the power of money was broken for the time being. Richard Foster goes on to write about how in the early church, as people would give, which they very commonly did, that what was going on is they were profaning something that in the world had become sacred. Every time a follower of Christ gives, he or she profanes something that in the world has become sacred. And he writes, without question, money has taken on a sacred character in our world. And it would do us good to find ways to defame it, defile it, 
and trample it under our feet. He says, list it way down on the scale of values, far below friendship and cheerful surroundings, and engage in the most profane act of all. Give it away. The powers that energize money cannot abide that most unnatural of acts. Giving. So how are you doing in this whole area of giving, in this whole area of generosity, in this whole area of greed? Giving is an act of worship. Giving is a, a litmus test of how much we really trust God for the things in our lives. And giving is a reflection of really where our treasure is. For where our treasure is, that's where our heart is. And so I pray, friends, that we will take these words to heart as we quietly renew our covenant with God and we say, Lord, I am not my own, that everything I have belongs to you. I pray that we will be able to, like Richard Foster, crucify greed and that we will be able to make giving that which is sacred in our everyday lives. Let's bow in a moment of prayer. Lord, it's not easy always to recognize greed in our own lives. So much of what we have, Lord, we believe we need. And yet it's true that so much of what we have is because we wanted it. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive us when we've made money our idol when we are, our security has only been in whatever we own, whatever wealth we may have amassed, and we forget that you are the owner of all these things, that we cannot take any of these things with us. So, Lord, we just pray that you would teach us about giving, about generosity, Remind us of where our treasure ought to be. And so, Lord, may we truly give to you, not out of compulsion, not because it's the done thing to do, not because of some great need in the church, but may we simply give out of obedience, out of gratitude for all that you have given to us. And so we pray, Lord God, that everyone who is watching or listening this morning may come to realize that wonderful promise in Malachi of how you will open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that we will not be able to contain it. And so, Lord God, teach us these truths. And even in this difficult day, when so many are struggling financially, Lord, may we learn the principle of sacrificial giving, giving in proportion to the way you have blessed us. And so, Lord God, may we challenge ourselves each and every day because there's such a need out there, Lord God. Make us a generous people so that we might bless others even as you bless us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. Have a wonderful day further and hope to see many of you next week. And for those of you who can't make it, 
We hope to connect with you on Sunday morning, hopefully after about 10.30 when our online service will be uh, up on our website. Bless you all.